This is the session on CRISPR in stem cell research. We have three great talks, so please stick around. Um, we're going to be talking about the application of CRISPR technology to uh, induce pluripotent stem cells as uh, models of, of normal biology and disease, and uh, also CRISPR activation and, and interference uh, technology applied in hematopoietic stem cells. <clears throat> so my name is Bill Scarns, a professor at the Jackson Laboratory for uh, Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. And I will start by talking about uh, high throughput gene editing using CRISPR technology in um, induced pluripotent stem cells of human. So let me share my screen. Okay, so the title of my talk uh, is precise and scalable genome editing of human stem cells. And um, I've been working with uh, engineering of stem cells for over 30 years. I started with mouse embryonic stem cells, um, which was about the only cell type that was e easily engineered uh, using conventional uh, gene targeting strategies. Uh, human iPS cells and ES cells were very difficult to engineer in the early days until CRISPR technology came along. And so I think the CRISPR technology has really opened up the possibility to actually start thinking about doing large genetic screens in a model cell. And I think the human iPS cell would be an ideal model cell to understand human biology and disease. So these induced pluripotent stem cells uh, can be maintained indefinitely in culture and they're re relatively stable. So they can maintain a normal karyotype for at least 25 passages in, in, in culture. That's not to say that they can't pick up other kinds of mutations or small rearrangements and so on, but they do maintain a normal karyotype for uh, quite a long time, which uh, makes them a good, I think, stable model to work with. Now, induced pluripotent stem cells have also have the property that you can differentiate these into virtually any cell type of the human body. So we can use these iPS cells to model uh, what's going on in different cell types. We can model diseases in different cell types. And I think they're just a fantastic platform for just understanding basic cell biology and early development, because these are normal diploid cells. This is unlike other cell types, which have highly abnormal genomes. Now I'm gonna concentrate really on the CRISPR editing uh, potential. Uh, in human iPS cells, uh, and I will show you some data which is um, <clears throat> very impressive, where the efficiency of CRISPR editing is now approaching 100%. So with uh, such efficiency in editing of human iPS cells, one could envision in the future uh, organized programs of cellular phenotyping around a resource of edited human iPS cells because we have access to a, a wide range of biology in human iPS cells, which include early human development with the development of embryoid cultures, uh, organ uh, development uh, with uh, organoid uh, technologies. We can study hematopoiesis and innate immunity. Uh, we can apply uh, large um, yeah, lo uh, genome-wide uh, screening like in metabolomics, uh, we can do detailed cell biology. And what I want to focus on today is uh, a rare disease project that we just started uh, with the NIH, which we call the INDI project. And I think the advantage of uh, thinking about this in an organized way is that we can generate standard alleles on standard genetic backgrounds for the research community to ensure reproducibility of data across different labs. So the project that we started in June is called the IPS Neurodegenerative Disease Initiative. Uh, this was is led by uh, two very uh, uh, two very talented scientists at the NIH, Mark Cookson and Michael Ward, and they envisioned this uh, project as a way to uh, develop disease models of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, but starting with a wild type what we call reference iPS cell lines. So as opposed to using patient-derived iPS cell lines, we can actually engineer uh, patient uh, mutations into a wild-type background from a healthy participant to generate large numbers of disease models. 
And so this project is going to, uh, it's a very ambitious project and it's going to go on for about four or five years where we will be introducing uh, mutations that are specific for uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia into a wild type genetic background. Uh, we will be characterizing these uh, <clears throat> clones uh, very deeply to make sure that they have maintained a normal genome and, and have normal differentiation uh, properties, and that these cell lines will then go out to the community for detailed study. So in addition to the patient mutations, we also are going to start generating what we call companion lines. And one of these uh, lines is going to include a very important control, which is to take the patient um, mutation and revert it to wild type. And this should uh, uh, be extremely useful in controlling for any uh, genome instability or off-target mutations that might have occurred during uh, editing and culture of these cell lines. And in addition, uh, we will be making uh, tagged uh, versions of the mutant gene and the wild type gene, and we'll also be making complete knockouts of each of these genes. So the research community will have a set of uh, uh, deeply characterized uh, iPS cell lines of, of these, of these uh, genotypes for study. And the project is, is quite ambitious, so we're uh, proposing to generate uh, over 500 uh, engineered cell lines uh, per year in this project. Now, some of the guiding principles that we came up with for the project, this was a discussion between Mark um, Cookson, Michael Ward, myself, and other collaborators, uh, is to really do this in a systematic and careful way. So the first principle is that we wanted to subclone the candidate reference iPS cell line. Even, the, uh, even though the iPS cell line is a, is a clone in a dish when it's originally uh, generated from a, from, from a um, person, from an indiv individual, there's often a chance that that, that cell line is not pure, that there could be genetic heterogeneity in that cell line particularly if it's been cultured for a period of time. So when we start thinking about editing iPS cell lines, the first thing that we will do is isolate individual clones. So if there's any heterogen uh, genetic heterogeneity in these uh, starting cell population, that's gonna segregate into the clones and that's gonna confound the, the analysis of the phenotype. So the first step in all of this is to subclone candidate reference iPS cell lines, which we've done. Uh, we've actually screened uh, subclones of eight different iPS cell lines from uh, Northern European population for this first year of study. Uh, and then the next step was to use data-driven selection to identify the reference iPS sub subclone that will be used for each year of production. So this uh, <clears throat> data uh, includes genome integrity assays, the carrier type, copy number variation, even down to whole genome sequence. We assay for TP53 function. We look at their editing potential, differentiation potential. So that we've gone through this process and for year one of production, we've identified a cell line called CALF 2.1, which is a male cell line. Uh, and then we will follow this uh, year on year with different iPS cell lines. And for year two, we're going to repeat the same set of editing experiments in a female line that's yes, yet to be identified. So a third guiding principle is we want to introduce only the SNV, the single nucleotide variant that is causative of disease without adding any, any additional uh, nucleotide vari variants. And one of the reasons why we add additional changes is to prevent recutting of the LEO by Cas9. But for this project, we're, we're, we want to make sure that we can uh, uh, revert this mutation. So we don't want to be adding any additional changes anyway. Uh, so we won't be adding PAM mutations. Uh, so we're just going to be introducing the single nucleotide variant. And that then allows us to create reversions of these clones so we can revert the SNV allele. And as I said earlier, this will control for any off-target mutations or genome instability that may have occurred during the generation of the uh, SNV clones. And so what we will be offering scientists will be an isogenic trio of edited clones, which includes the SNV in a heterozygous and a homozygous state, as well as the uh, revertance of the hetero heterozygous SNV clone back to wild type. And finally, no, from lessons that we've learned over the past five, six years about uh, um, 
CRISPR-Cas9 editing and just culturing of iPS cells is that we want to be uh, careful that we do not select for abnormal clones. And so we're going to be uh, 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 executing deep quality control of post-edited clones before uh, making them available. So let's just talk about the, um, the way in which we uh, generate single nucleotide variants in human iPS cells. Of course, we use Cas9 or Cas12A um, uh, uh, programmable nucleases for this, and we're using them in the RNP format. This is the most efficient way that we know of to introduce Cas9 or Cas12A activity into iPS cells. So what happens is that you get a double-stranded break, and then we have two uh, possible pathways for the uh, repair of those double-strand breaks. The, the dominant pathway in iPS cells is non-homologous end joining. This is where the two ends are brought together by NHEJ in an error-prone repair mechanism, which often in, in introduces insertions or deletions in the gene. If we add a donor template, which has homology to this uh, region around the breakpoint, we can also, with nucleotide precision, introduce single nucleotide variants using a simple oligonucleotide donor with a single base change. However, that's fairly inefficient. When we started this, um, even with Cas9 RNP delivery, we were getting on the order of 10% of unselected cells with the desired change. So to improve this, we developed a BFP-GFP reporter assay for editing SNVs. It's based on Jacob Korn's BFP-GFP assay. But in this case, we're looking at just making a single change, a C to T change, which changes the histidine in BFP to a tyros uh, tyrosine residue, which, uh, which makes uh, the protein fluoresce as a green fluorescent protein. So we go from BFP to GFP with just a single base change. You can see here the C to T. And then we just run that through facts after we allow the cells to recover and we can accurately quantitate the amount of HDR, NHEJ and unedited alleles in this uh, pool of cells. So uh, we tested a bunch of different conditions uh, and, and reagents over a period of two or three years. And it really boils down to three different conditions which have made a significant effect on improving HDR efficiency. So the first is to add HDR enhancer. Um, this is a small molecule, which is a, a human ligase four inhibitor. And that's effective in uh, promoting HDR. If we combine that with cold shock, we see even uh, further improvement up to 50% HDR efficiency. And then if we add a uh, single-stranded oligonucleotide, which has been modified at both ends, uh, this, this is a product from IDT, we can get uh, up to 70% HDR efficiency. So you can see with just uh, changes, th these small changes in, in conditions, we can reverse this, um, <clears throat> this bias towards NHEJ in favor of HDR. And this was published last year in a methods uh, paper. Uh, and since then, we've made a few more tweaks and optimized the conditions even further. So we've reduced the amount of Cas9 RNP that we add. We have substituted a new HDR enhancer called version 2 from IDT, which should be commercially available soon. And we've extended cold shock to three days. And you can see that we're now getting above 90% HDR efficiency with very few uh, unmodified alleles and very little NHEJ. So this is quite remarkable. Another uh, very interesting result was to, to find that we don't require a pre-assembly step of the Cas9 RNP. So initially we would add Cas9 protein and synthetic guide RNA together in a test tube and let it sit for an hour before doing the nucleofection. But we find that we can actually add it directly to the nucleofection with no time for assembly and get similar results. So this is very convenient. And it shows you that this Cas9 RNP is actually getting assembled quite efficiently in the cell. So we have a very simple editing workflow for this project. So we're doing these nucleofections now in parallel in small volumes in a 16 well max cuvette. Uh, it's showing you the conditions that we use. So after nucleofection, we 
allow the cells to recover, then we freeze them away. And at our leisure, we can thaw these cell, cell pools uh, uh, as many as we'd like in a week. And we would then do single cell uh, cloning, which is essentially to plate a low a number of cells onto a 10 centimeter dish. We would plate typically 1500 cells and wait for colonies to appear and then pick those colonies into duplicate plates, one which we freeze and one which we lyse and genotype. So here's an example, it's an impressive example of one of our first experiments using these optimized conditions uh, where we were trying to make a single bit nucleotide change uh, outside of the seed region for the guide RNAs. You can see here, it's the last position of the guide or the first base of the guide sequence. Uh, and we were able to get uh, plenty of heterozygote and homozygote clones from a screen of 96, even with a single nucleotide change in this position. So we've now done over 70 of these experiments and we have genotyping data for these now. And um, this is typical uh, results that we're seeing, which are, which are quite remarkable. So on the left, about a third of the experiments are giving us a good number of heterozygous and homozygous SNV clones, but about two thirds, the, these are the two panels in the middle, you can see are giving us an overwhelming number of homozygous with very few heterozygous clones. And that we believe that's because the efficiency of editing is so high that there are very few wild type or unedited alleles uh, left in cells, so we don't get heterozygous clones. So by optimizing these conditions, we've actually created a problem for ourselves. We're not getting the genotypes that we want from many of these experiments, which are heterozygous clones. We're getting plenty of homozygous, but not enough heads. The example on the far right is actually interesting because it looks like that this is a gene which is essential in human iPS cells, because we're not able to get any homozygous clones, but we get a huge number of heterozygous clones. So that's indication, indication we think of a cell lethal phenotype. But fortunately, these are rare among the genes that we are targeting currently. Okay, so how do we, uh, how, how do we deal with this problem of getting too high of an editing, too high rate of biallelic editing of cells? So um, what we wanna do is be able to control the zygosity uh, of the cells that, that come out of editing. So we wanna control the outcome in cells, and we found, we've managed to uh, do this with a very simple trick, which is to add dead Cas9 to the nucleofection. So the idea is very simple. If we have a mixture of Cas9 and dead Cas9 in the nucleofection, we would expect the dead Cas9 will, will bind at some frequency to the uh, target site, but it won't cleave that target site. It will just sit there and block it from you know, getting cleaved by active Cas9. And on the other chromosome, active Cas9 will go ahead and make the break and we'll get the SNV. And this seems to work uh, uh, quite well using the BFP GFP assay. Again, we can see that if we mix Cas9 and DCAS9 together at a one to four ratio, we can really shift the balance of alleles from HDR uh, back to wild type. So we've carried out a pilot experiment where we took several of these examples where we got overwhelming numbers of homozygous um, HDR, and we just added in increasing amounts of Cas9 and DCAS9, and you can see very clearly how we can change the zygosity of the clones that come from these experiments. One in four gives us almost entirely wild type again, whereas a one in two intermediate amount of Cas9, DCAS9, we're starting to see a good number of heterozygous clones. So we're following this up now with um, trying to uh, test even slightly lower concentrations of DCAS9 to see if we can find um, uh, conditions that give us a good mixture of heterozygous and homozygous clones. So, so this year, a very important paper was uh, published by Dominic Paquet, who looked very carefully at iPS cells that have been edited uh, to find that there's quite a lot of on-target uh, effects that are occurring in edited iPS cell clones. And what, what, they, what they documented was uh, up to 40% of the iPS cell clones had deletions of uh, one copy of the gene or one a region around the, the target site and one on one chromosome. That's a problem because then you end up with a, a mutated gene on one chromosome and, a, and your SNV on the other. The second problem is uh, that they, they saw copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. So what happens is you double-stranded break 
induces loss of heterozygosity, which can extend for megabases down, downstream of the target uh, to the end of the chromosome. So these are events that we really want to avoid. Uh, so for the uh, Indy project, we're going to, we are going to run a, a, a many assays to make sure that these post-edited clones are normal. So we'll start with Sanger sequencing at both on and off target sites. And then we'll use PacBio long read technology to look for these problems of on target um, effects where we might have a deletion or uh, we might have loss of heterozygosity. We'll also be looking at copy number variation within the clone. We'll carry type it, do whole genome sequence uh, and pluritest in mycoplasma. So these clones are gonna be very carefully QC'd and we'll be able to uh, add to the uh, information on, on what happens to IPS clones after editing. So to summarize, I think we have uh, uh, developed uh, very efficient and precise methods for editing human IPS cells, which is, which is scalable. So we can actually start to think now about generating genome-wide collections of IPS cell lines with various kinds of alleles. Uh, the first kind of allele that we're, we're starting with is a simple one, SNVs, but we might be able to use these um, we, we expect we'll be able to use these conditions and technologies to uh, generate other more complex alleles uh, in the future. So let me just introduce you to the people who have helped with this project. Uh, most importantly, Justin McDonough, who is the uh, project manager for Indy. He also runs the core uh, in, uh, cell editing service at the JAXGM, gm and a number of talented research scientists and technicians. And, and we're currently expanding this to include uh, additional research assistants and scientists. I also really want to thank IDT for sharing unpublished or uh, uh, so new uh, new reagents with us as they as they develop them at, at IDT, which includes the HDR enhancer and the end blocked oligonucleotides, which made make a big difference. And of course, Synthago, who have provided us with these very effective uh, synthetic guide RNAs for this research. So with that, I'll stop and take questions. Uh, one question uh, from James Cooper is, how difficult is it to edit a cell line introducing SNV only without mutations to the PAM? Well, initially we thought this might be a problem because if you're just making a single nucleotide change in your target sequence, that's just the one base difference to the guide RNA. And so you might expect that you would get that guide RNA coming back and uh, recleaving the, the, the the uh, modified allele and, and inducing damage in that modified allele. But because we're using uh, Cas9 RNP uh, and we are uh, limiting the amounts that we put into cells, uh, we think that that RNP goes away quick enough that we don't have this problem of retargeting of the modified alleles. So we're able to introduce, as you can see in our data, uh, SNVs without having to resort to mutating the PAM site. So that was uh, interesting and, and a little bit of a surprise. So do you see any issues with genome integrity in your second step data-driven selection of reference IPS cell lines? Uh, so I think second step data-driven selection. Um, so yes, we. so in selecting the, the cell lines, there were eight candidate lines there were issues um, with some of the lines in terms of the um, array data, the copy number variation that we observed. Um, they were all um, pretty well characterized to begin with, so they were all karyotypically normal. So there were some subtle uh, problems that were detected in the, uh, in, in the other cell lines, and only one of the cell lines that we tested uh, met all of the criteria, and that was the call of 2.1 cells that we're now using for, 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 for the first year of production. So yes, there are um, uh, uh, differences that you find even between well-characterized um, normal IPS cell lines. Okay, I think we're, uh, one last question, and then I will move on. Uh, have you tried using base editors so that you don't have any double-stranded breaks to create your SNV? And the answer to that is yes. I think we could use base editors for this, um, but at the moment, um, we don't have recombinant protein base editing 
technology. We don't have uh, access to recombinant protein. We might be able to use mRNA. It's something that we are um, continuing to keep an eye on because it could be uh, even a um, safer way to introduce um, a single nucleotide changes uh, into cells without having to worry about the effects of making double-stranded breaks. I would say, though, that for some of the other alleles that we want to make, like knock-in of halo tags and so on, we can't use base editors. So I, th so I think for those applications, we will stick with the um, Cas9 endonuclease technology. Okay, so let me now turn it over to uh, Chris Saha. Chris is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he's going to uh, tell us a, a very interesting story about how we can use patient-derived iPS cells um, for, uh, uh, for therapeutics. Chris, over to you. All right. First of all, it's fantastic to be here. Um, that was a really exciting story uh, that we just heard. And I think we'll, uh, my lab is building upon that. Um, so I'm, I'm here in Madison, Wisconsin, and would like to tell you about how we're using patient-specific um, cell lines, iPS lines, to make functional tissues to test genome editors and potential candidate genome editing therapeutics. And um, some of this work is really inspired by a larger consortium that I'm helping to lead. Uh, it's funded in the US by the uh, National Institutes of Health, and it's called the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium. It's, um, fairly large effort that um, is trying to develop a modular toolkit such that you can uh, deliver editors into the body to directly edit um, endogenous um, alleles that may be um, problematic. And so uh, the kind of major initiatives are, are shown at the bottom here and the video is kind of going through um, different areas of, of emphasis. So certainly we're working on new editors, base editors, mitochondrial editors, um, to kind of diversify the types of edits that we can make, both DNA, RNA, and other nucleic acids in the cell. What I'll be focusing on here is what you see in the video, which is new biological systems, namely human biological systems, that we can engineer using uh, stem cell bioengineering. And uh, a number of the uh, projects use human pluripotent stem cells that you just heard about um, as essentially the raw uh, substrate to engineer various tissues. And today I'll give you a focus story uh, about tissues of the eye. And uh, with our uh, team here at, at Wisconsin, namely David Gam's lab, who's pioneered some of the differentiation methods of going from stem cells into um, various tissues of the eye, namely the pigmented epithelial uh, layer, or ret uh, retinal pigmented epithelium that I'll be mostly talking about today. But we also have projects that are um, in 3D retinal organoids that have uh, photoreceptors as well as uh, ganglion cells and other um, uh, structures that are in kind of the inner uh, retina here. So that's um, uh, shown in, by my laser pointer in this black area that would be for the retinal organoid. The RPE, the epithelial, is in the back. And uh, clinically, this um, layer, the epithelia, as well as the photoreceptors, are accessible through a subretinal injection. And so um, Eddie Tuss's product is delivered that way. And, and there's... Uh, quite a bit of excitement in the field of um, delivering many other types of editors into the subretinal space. This can be done um, fairly uh, easily by uh, trained surgeons. So uh, the eye, in, from my point of view, is a very exciting place to do genome editing, uh, namely because uh, there's a, a lot of need out there and the, the genetics and uh, of various um, disorders are, are quite diverse. So this Venn diagram, um, it shows the, the genes that have been identified. Um, that was about 10 years ago for, for a number of different visual disorders. And this list has just increased um, every year. I'll be focusing on this one gene um, that leads to um, 
macular degeneration as, and um, problems in vision called BEST1. BEST disease is uh, one where uh, central vision, as you can see here, this is what um, patients uh, who have BEST disease would see. Uh, they would lose central vision. Uh, you can see kind of buildup, uh, abnormal buildup of, um, of material here in the back of the eye. And again, that's uh, largely because this BEST1 gene is overexpressed in that epithelial layer that I'll talk about. Uh, the challenge here is, and is that there are no uh, treatments for this disease, but also uh, for kind of preclinical and early stage work, there's no uh, very good animal models of the disease that really recapitulate what the patients are um, uh, pro progressing through and what clinicians are seeing. And so this motivates the use of using human um, stem cells uh, as a model system. And so BEST1 is a transmembrane uh, protein. It encodes for this um, uh, you know, fairly large protein that has several domains. And I'll be um, focusing in on some of the red uh, mutations that are shown here in this um, in this uh, schematic that have been autosomal dominant uh, mutations. So one copy will lead to disease. And in this uh, scenario, what we've done is taken um, a, a number of patients, generated IPS lines uh, through reprogramming from their blood or skin, and then differentiated them into RPE. What we focused on is um, patients that have these uh, particular mu mutations uh, in important areas of this um, uh, channel. So BEST1 encodes a, a multimer. Uh, so there's a homopentameric channel, meaning that there's five uh, proteins that come together really in this type of orientation, according to the crystal structure that was recently um, uh, solved. And dominant um, uh, patients with the dominant form of the disease have one um, problematic mutant copy. And the goal of our uh, CRISPR technique is to specifically cut and uh, disrupt the mutant copy such that the, the remaining untouched, in theory, wild type copy would take over and essentially flood this uh, homopentameric uh, channel into all wild type forms. And uh, what we learned really um, is that it does matter which um, particular edit um, that you're making and which particular mutation the patient has. And so I'll go through that data in the next few slides. Um, what we chose to use as our candidate uh, gene therapy here is to uh, drive uh, SPI Cas9 um, and have a 2A with a uh, GFP in, in many of these studies and a separate promoter that drives the mutant allele specific guide RNA to cut this uh, mutant allele. And we get very good um, transduction uh, of these human RPE layers. Um, and the promoter here is driven by the endogenous best one uh, promoter. So we have uh, cell type specific expression of our editor. And um, some of the studies that we can do in RPE is both single cell, we can patch clamp a single cell, look for uh, current flow through there, and that would be a chloride current flow. Um, or we could take a, a whole kind of monolayer and look for whether it um, degrades uh, some of the photoreceptor outer segments that uh, they naturally do inside the eye. And so this is one example for one specific patient that has this mutant allele R218C, um, that uh, single base change is uh, C to T here. And so what we do is we design our guide to be specific to the mutant allele um, such that it will specifically cut this allele. And so when we do this, um, we, and, and we take out the cells, extract genomic DNA and sequence it through a, a Lumina deep sequencers, um, we get our wild type allele showing up as our most common read. Um, and that's approximately 50% of our reads, which is um, good. Uh, and 
The next most common is the untouched mutant allele, which is 12%. So we haven't com completely eliminated it. But then you can start to see um, some of the, uh, the the mutant alleles that come out. So here's a, a two-base pair deletion. Um, there's a uh, insertion here. And so there's, there's a number of indels here that on the whole, end up uh, generating 94% frame shift. And, and frame shifts are important because those trigger nonsense mediated decay. And the specificity is high. And so we can um, we have an isogenic control that we've generated using methods um, uh, similar to what we just heard in the first talk, uh, where we've corrected that R218C back to the wild type in the IPS cell state and then differentiated them to RPE. When we apply the mutant specific allele editor, we see some cutting, but not as much, and not um, as much as you would see in the actual uh, mutant specific line. And um, the off target sites that we uh, identify using uh, bioinformatic techniques, the top off target site is actually the wild type allele. So it's, actually, it's, it's a bit confusing there, and we get um, some cutting, uh, but we also identify uh, some cutting at one um, place in chromosome seven that um, we actually only saw when we used the uh, uh, RPE differentiated cells. We did not see that when we applied the um, a similar editing technique on IPS cells. So there's some value, I think, of using the different differentiated cell type to identify off-target, um, potential off-target modifications. And overall, when we looked at all of our strategies for the different patients, uh, the mutant allele specific strategy ended up disrupting the mutant allele in about 70, per, uh, at about 70%, 66, you know, plus or minus 10% here. Um, and they all gave remarkably high levels of um, frame shifts. And I think that might have to do with DNA repair processes in the RPE specifically that are largely a non-dividing cell that um, ends up having a plus one um, uh, mutation spectrum in terms of insert insertion of bases. When we do uh, functional tests on single cells, we see a rescue whenever we do the mutant allele specific editor. So this is uh, one of the patients, A146K, uh, 218C uh, on the far right is what I uh, focused on before. And then we had another patient here with a 296H uh, editor. Um, and they all seem to increase the current here, which is uh, represented by a diagonal line in this current density voltage plot. And uh, one level further, we looked for transcriptional perturbations in these specific cell type. So what we could do uh, using 10x single cell RNA-seq is to track cells that actually have um, transcripts uh, arising from our uh, uh, lentiviral construct. And as expected, the, the expression level of our um, Cas9 GFP is, this, is similar to what is um, endogenously being driven uh, best one using the best one promoter. Uh, what we looked at in more detail was to uh, see whether there was any abnormal um, gene expression whenever we delivered our editor. And what this plot is, is a lot of different samples, but um, there are three different patient lines um, at, from the dominant allele um, mutation shown here. One, two, three, and in each of those lines, we've de delivered an editor that was targeted against a mutant allele or a control region that's that's not um, coding in the cell. And so uh, these are uh, UMAP projections of the 10x data, and largely they're very similar. And when we look at differentially expressed genes. Um, there's very few that pop up on the whole, except for this one sample where we see quite a bit of um, genes that came up dif uh, significantly different. In this case, in the control uh, targeted, um, with the control targeted editor. And a lot of that had to do with stress response and innate immune response. So this, this could be a story 
uh, related to transcriptional changes from just simple transduction and DNA damage. Um, but we're, we're looking more into this. But on the old, the, the actual going after the mutant allele didn't seem to trigger any um, consistent changes across their samples. And so I'll stop there and, and say that we um, had seven patient-specific IPS lines. It helped us um, find information uh, in a case where there's no good animal model, and it gave us um, functional information of how cells in this specific cell type would respond to a particular CRISPR therapeutic strategy. And I think this is um, a type of techniques that will be um, scaled up uh, through the somatic cell genome editing uh, consortium that I mentioned, uh, as well as many others in the field. Um, before I sign off, I, was, I wanted to highlight this uh, special issue that we're taking uh, papers for. Uh, so Stephen saying at Columbia and I are guest editing this. Uh, if you have similar stories in the eye uh, on genome editing. And uh, lastly, there's a lot of uh, great people in, in the lab that contributed to this, namely uh, Ben Stair, who recently graduated, and Divya Sinha in, in the GAM lab. With that, I'll take uh, questions. Thank you, uh, Chris, for a nice talk. So I'm looking at the q and I don't see any questions specifically for you at this point time you may get some later um, after the talk and you can answer those um, at your leisure so i think we'll move on to our next speaker rasmus back who is an assist associate professor at uh, Aarhus. i hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that right Aarhus university in denmark so a guest from europe a speaker from europe and he's going to tell us about his experiences with crispr interference in CRISPR activation in human uh, hematopoietic stem cells. Great, thank you, Bill. So I'll be talking about CRISPR activation and CRISPR inhibition, uh, mainly focusing on, on hematopoietic stem cells, but also in, 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 in different, I'll be presenting data from different cell lines in general. Um, I have single disclosure to make, but the work I'll be presenting is uh, completely from my academic lab. So as you are probably all aware of, uh, CRISPR by now is a molecular Swiss army knife. There are so many purposes that you can use this tool for, but the, the translational um, uh, focus of this uh, tool is mainly using uh, the function of generating knockouts or knock-ins. And just uh, to recapitulate from where I'm coming from, uh, we published uh, some work during my postdoc. This is the, uh, published in 2015 together with a previous colleague of mine, Ayal Handel, where we showed that these chemically modified guide RNAs that are protected in both ends can uh, yield very high levels of uh, gene editing rates, particularly in primary uh, cells such as T cells and hematopoietic stem cells. So here's shown data on the right, um, getting up to uh, 90, 95 percent of indels in these two cell types. And we also showed that we could edit, edit uh, hematopoietic stem cells doing targeted knock-in here, showing GFP reported gene knock-in into hematopoietic stem cells. In this case, um, getting high rates in this particular donor of 74% targeted integration. We can sort out all these green uh, stem and progenitor cells, transplant them into an immunodeficient mouse. And after four months in a mouse, we can see that there is human chimerism in the bone marrow and all the cells are still green. And the cells still give rise to multi-lineage uh, repopulation. So just showing that this system is, is very potent with the chemically modified guide RNAs uh, in, a, in a highly clinical setting, and this is exactly what uh, Matt Portia showed some data uh, from uh, in a previous session. So coming back to the Swiss Army knife, uh, we've now turned our focus on, uh, on some of the other derived technologies, mainly the CRISPR activation and CRISPR inhibition uh, or repression interference technologies, if you will, trying to apply some of the same uh, principles to this. And it's, it, these tools are very, very simple. Um, you deactivate the catalytic function of Cas9, so it doesn't cleave the DNA, and then you fuse a uh, domain to the Cas9 protein. This could be a transcriptional activation domain or several domains that it will facilitate activation, or it can be a, a transcriptional inter interfering domain. And then you target uh, this, uh, these complexes to 
uh, a site close to the transcriptional start site. Here is sort of um, the rules that we have stuck to. And to uh, get high rates, or at least hope to get high rates in some of the primary cells that can be very difficult to um, deliver genetic material to, we turned our attention to also some pre previous data uh, here showing that in primary human T cells, we can get very high delivery of messenger RNA to these cells. So almost all the cells are transfected and expressing high levels of the transgene. So, Initially, I'll just focus on CRISPR activation and what many studies have used is either plasmid delivery for this system or lentiviral delivery for, for example, library screens. So we wanted to compare an RNA delivery strategy to a plasmid delivery strategy. So the plasmid strategy is a two-part system, two plasmids, or it might be several plasmids because in most settings we're using four guide RNAs targeting the same uh, locus or the same uh, site in the promoter just before the transcriptional start site. And, and for the RNA delivery system, we're making in vitro transcribed messenger RNA and co-delivering that with chemically modified guide RNAs. Uh, looking at some molar ratios that we previously devised and these molar ratios were also devised from a previous publication. Um, so this is the, basic setup, the guide RNA design is from previous publications where they designed highly optimized um, libraries for CRISPR activation and also interference. And uh, this is the general concept of tiling uh, mainly for guide RNAs uh, right around the promoter region at the transcriptional start site. And we focused on uh, proteins or genes that are expressed uh, uh, on the surface of the uh, cells that we can analyze this by flow cytometry, thereby having a single cell resolution. And this is experiment targeting uh, CD184, or CXCR4 protein. Using the plasmid system, we can see that we get nice upregulation with a 62% uh, uh, of the cells now expressing a gene that was previously completely suppressed. You also notice here that for you see a highly heterogeneous population of, of cells that express this gene. So when we instead delivered, and this is all delivery by electroporation, when we deliver it using an all RNA system, you can see that we're getting really homogeneous levels of, of activation here and also a bit higher, uh, at least on average, than the plasmid-based system. This is for CXCR4, as I mentioned, targeting CD5. CRISPR activation by plasmid delivery works a little better. 86% of the cells are positive, but again, heterogeneously upregulated. For the messenger RNA system, it looks um, much more homogeneous. So this was a quite striking difference and looked very promising. This is in K562 cells, which I, I should emphasize. We also wanted to make sure that for this application of the CRISPR system, we were still at an optimal uh, at optimal levels of the guide RNAs and the and the messenger RNA, and uh, we were in fact hitting just the sweet spot of uh, of upregulation. Here is the percent positive cells, and here is the mean fluorescence intensity. So of course, we also looked at the time course of upregulation. Uh, please note that this is not a, a numerical scale. Um, we get really uh, high levels of upregulation very fast. Within four hours, you get almost high, full uh, upregulation. This is using either uh, one guide RNA targeting CXCR4, a different guide RNA, or the two guide RNAs combined. So this is not a four guide RNA system, but only a two guide RNA system. And you can see that the guide RNA2 gives almost the same upregulation as both of them uh, combined. And it wears off uh, after about four days. If you look at the mean fluorescence intensity, you'll see a, a higher difference between the, uh, the combinatorial guide RNA and, and the guide RNA2 that was very, uh, seemed very functional based on the percentage of cells that expressed uh, the, the gene. Uh, so you can tune the degree of upregulation by only including a single guide RNA or a, a, a less potent guide RNA. So we turned uh, towards several targets that were still expressed on the surface of the cells. This is data from CD90 upregulation and CD201. Again, seeing really potent upregulation of these two genes. Uh, but we also observed genes that were more difficult to uh, upregulate. Uh, this is using four guides targeting the promoter of CD19, where we only see a suboptimal upregulation. And we also noticed genes that uh, um, didn't display any upregulation at all. 
Um, so that was a bit of a, a surprise to us and why this didn't work. It could be the four guides that we had chosen for this uh, particular gene. So we screened six additional guide RNAs around the same site, still didn't see any upregulation. So we tested all 10 guide RNAs to see if they were functional just for generating indels in the genome. And in fact, they were all functional. So that's where we are now with this gene. We, we, we can't seem to upregulate it. And, and of course, uh, thoughts um, uh, we go towards the uh, epigenetic state of this gene that might influence um, this. So this is just uh, showing um, all 14 target genes that we screen in K562 cells. We see high upregulation for uh, six, I believe, uh, eight, eight of those genes, suboptimal uh, upregulation for four of the genes, and we weren't really able to upregulate the, these two genes. This is then testing again whether or not a single guide RNA would be uh, sufficient to uh, perform the upregulation. Um, and as you can see, uh, for CD5, we only had three guide RNAs. They all performed quite similarly, and that was the case for these uh, four genes. And when you combined all three or four guide RNAs, we didn't see uh, much higher, uh, at least percent of cells that expressed the, the target gene. But if you looked at the MFI of the cells, you could see that uh, there was high expression of the, the, the targeted trans genes when we combined all guide RNAs. Then we tried to multiplex this. Could we target all these four genes simultaneously? If we took the most potent guide RNA, we could get all genes regulated, uh, upregulated uh, by almost 70%. And the optimal condition was with two guides per gene. So that would be electroporation with eight guides in total. Uh, and beyond that, we would see a decline in activation, probably because of saturation of the system. So it seems like a single guide RNA per gene, if it's, a, if it's an optimal guide RNA, can facilitate uh, multiplexed activation uh, simultaneously of different genes. And then we turned uh, towards primary cells. This is data from CD34 positive uh, hematopoietic uh, stem and progenitor cells. And we targeted these four genes, as you'll see up here, these are the basal levels expressed uh, in CD34 cells. And when we introduce the CRISPR activation system by electroporation again, we see uh, high upregulation. I don't have the numbers here, but it's, uh, I believe it's uh, above 85% uh, for all these target genes. So translating very well to a clinically relevant cell type. We also tested CD3 positive T cells for these two genes, works uh, just as well here in this setting. This is human T cells. We also tested it in some murine cells. This is 3G3 fibroblast, uh, a T cell line and primary T cells. This is only targeting a single gene, CCR7. And as you can see here, we get potent upregulation in the two cell lines. The primary T cells from mice are a little bit more difficult to work with, but we can regulate, uh, upregulate CCR7 a little bit. We then got a hold of uh, some recombinant protein. This is not the, tr the tri uh, uh, the tripartite um, uh, activator domain, the VPR domain. This is only the VP64 domain. So uh, we would expect, expect this RNP to be a little less efficient than the mRNA that we are um, using, which is also the case here for CD5. If we compare the upregulation uh, facilitated by the RNP complex, it's potent, but it's not as potent as the mRNA. For some of the other genes, it's it's almost as potent as uh, messenger RNA. This is uh, CXCR4, and finally for CD201, you'll see um, just as high, if not better, upregulation with uh, RMP. And then we turn towards CRISPR interference or CRISPR I with the same RNA system in vitro transcribed um, um, messenger RNA uh, with uh, DCAS9 CRAP. And here we are repressing the CD201 gene in K562 cells. It's not highly expressed in K562 cells, and it's not that difficult to downregulate it. This is just using single guide RNAs or a combination of three guide RNAs, and we can completely suppress the expression of this gene. Then we turn to human T cells and try to repress a highly expressed gene. This is CD5. Uh, as you'll see here in this gate, and we can actually get all the cells out of this gate, or almost at least, but we can't fully repress this uh, this gene. 
And finally, we also try to do orthogonal uh, or uh, opposing uh, uh, gene regulation. So here we uh, have to turn to orthogonal CRISPR systems for the repression. We can use the SP uh, CRISPR system and for activation, we can use the SA CRISPR system so that the guide RNAs do not interfere with uh, each other. Um, so we try to do that. And this is an experiment in K562 cells upregulating uh, CXCR4 and downregulating CD201. So we are looking here at the basal levels in K562 cells, and we are then hoping to see all the cells turn to quadrant three, and that's exactly what happens here, very potent. In human T cells, we activated CD271 and downregulated CD5. And again, we can't completely repress CD5, but we can we can get them under the, the level of the highly expressing cells here. So it looks quite promising, although we cannot fully repress some of the genes at least. So the take home messages here is that an RNA based delivery of, of CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I components can give very high efficiencies of targeted transcriptional regulation. We've done this in a, in a bunch of cell types now and it seems to be highly functional, at least for most of the genes. There are genes that we cannot seem to uh, regulate at the moment and, and we're of course looking further into that. It's uh, quite rapid. Uh, it's turned on uh, in hours and it's transient, so it, it wears off within a few days. And this can also be tuned a little bit uh, depending on the choice of the guide RNAs. And we can activate uh, several genes simultaneously and we can use this orthogonal uh, CRISPR system to, um, to, to do opposing transcription regulation at the same time. So I think this is a, a, a really promising tool to, to study basic biology of some of these primary cell types, but it also might be possible to implement this technology, these technologies um, in cell therapies and even gene therapy to, to enhance some of these cell products. And acknowledgements here, the work was mainly driven by a postdoc, Trine Jensen, uh, together with other members from the lab. And I also have to acknowledge uh, the support from Synthego. I won a genome engineer innovation grant uh, that supported uh, precisely this project. And with that, I'd like to, uh, to thank again Synthego for inviting me and I take questions. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Erasmus. That was really impressive. So we have one question for you in the Q&A and I have one of my own. Um, so the question is, do you see the same four-day kinetics in CD35 plus and CD3 plus as in K562? Yeah, so we're actually performing those experiments uh, right as we speak almost. Um, uh, so I can I can actually only say what we're seeing in the CD34 cells uh, as, as the expression turns on, not as it wears off, but it's it seems to be turned on just as fast. Within uh, within hours, we can see the first uh, cells um, start expressing these target genes. So it, it's quite amazing. I would have thought it would take longer, but within two hours after expiration, we see expression. Okay, a second question has come in. Do you see any difference in toxicity between using RNA versus RNP in primary cells? Yeah, of course, that's been a, a long-standing uh, question in, in this field also for introducing indels and, and, and doing HDR and targeted gene correction. Uh, there is some toxicity with uh, the RNA-based systems. You can tweak these a little bit by, by, by ch changing or modifying some of the nucleotides during the in vitro transcription. Um, but there is some sensing of these RNAs inside the cells uh, uh, and it does impact the cells a little bit, not too much. It's, it do doesn't compare to plasmid delivery at all. That's just uh, completely toxic to these cells. But, but RNP is generally less toxic. Um, so if, if it's possible, I'd, I would definitely advise uh, to use this system. Okay, one last question. Uh, did you check the differentiation progenitor potential of the HSCs after activation of your target gene? Yeah, no, we, we haven't tested that, but we are looking in, uh, in into transplants and, and we'll have data from that at some point. Okay, there are questions that are continuing to come in, but I think we should stop there at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Erasmus and Chris, for your wonderful talks and I would just say, enjoy the rest of your day on CRISPR World Day. <laughs>